Welcome. We're glad you're joining us today for our podcast. Today we are, are going to review a number of the, the little books. We have Enos and Jerem, Omni, Words of Mormon, and the first three chapters of Mosiah. And as I wondered, after reading and studying through the material, the best approach to this might be just to uh, spend a little time with each book and perhaps pull out and uh, review a couple of the spiritual gems that uh, may have been forgotten at times. Okay, much of what I'm going to share with you today, I'm going to take from some conversations uh, from Brother Hugh Nibley, one of my uh, professors at BYU back in the 70s. I really enjoyed uh, Brother Nibley's classes. I was taking classes on archaeology and anthropology and uh, some of those uh, scriptural-based uh, courses, and, and he was my professor. So let's begin with uh, the book of Enos. Enos, as you'll remember, was taught by his father Jacob, who was a high priest. And let's not forget, his uncle was Nephi. His father taught him in the language and admonition of the Lord. Enos apparently uh, was not satisfied with the way things were going. In fact, he, he wrestled with himself and struggled in the spirit because of some of the things that his father had said to him concerning eternal life and the joy of the saints. And I quote, And my soul hungered, and I kneeled down before mine maker, and I cried unto him in mighty prayer and supplication for my own soul. And all the day long did I cry unto him. And when the night came, I did still raise my voice high to reach the heaven. And there came a voice unto me, saying, Enos, thy sins are forgiven thee. So, what was this all about? What was Enos so concerned about? Well, apparently it was guilt. It was guilt. Guilt gives one, of course, a sense of inad inadequacy, and guilt kind of follows you around. And the more guilt you have, the harder it is to overcome. Enos said, and I quote, my guilt was swept away. And why was it swept away? Because of Enos's faith in Christ. In Enos, Verse 8, it says, Wherefore, go to, thy faith hath made thee whole. Now it came to pass that when I had heard these words, I began to desire for the welfare of my brethren, the Nephites. And so with his guilt being conquered, he now turned his attention to uh, his brethren, the Nephites. Uh, his faith was growing stronger every minute. And so what was, what was Enos concerned about? Why was he praying and struggling so much? Well, apparently it was guilt. Uh, guilt gives one a sense of inadequacy. And in fact, the longer you wait to resolve guilt, the more challenging it becomes to take care of. Enif said, and I quote, My guilt was swept away. And why was it swept away? Because of his faith in Christ. In Enos 8, it says, And he said unto me, Because of thy faith in Christ, whom thou hast never before heard nor seen, and many years pass away before he shall manifest himself in the flesh, wherefore go to, thy faith hath made thee whole. Well, now it seems that Enos' desire, now that he'd conquered his guilt, his desire was for his brethren, the Lamanites. And so now we see that that, that Enos's faith had gone from a personal thing to that of his brother and the Nephites, and his faith became unshaken in the Lord, it says. And so he prayed for his brother and the Nephites. He wasn't per probably too pleased with the answer he got relative to them, but he turned towards his cousins, his brethren, the, the Lamanites, his enemies of all things, and he's praying for them. Well, the answer that he got relative to the Lamanites or to the Nephites inferred that they were not going to survive. And so with that in mind, he said, And the Lord covenanted with me, however, that he would bring forth our record, the record of the Nephites, to the Lamanites in their own due time. So he'd conquered his guilt. He wanted to, to assist and help his brother the Nephites. He was not that's not going to happen. They were not going to survive. So he turned to the, to the Lamanites and he wanted to have them helped by way of the sacred record that the Nephites had kept. Well, Patriarch Lehi and Uncle Nephi had also asked the Lord for the same things. 
Enos now, with unshakable faith, went about proselyting and prophesying of things to come. Enos tells us that he saw war between the Nephites and the Lamanites, and that he must soon go down to his grave. So it becomes apparent that this record of Enos was recorded towards the latter part of his life. In fact, it says that it had been 179 years since they left Jerusalem. Well, the last verse, verse 27 in Enos, in Enos says that uh, it's, it's really a good scripture for today. I'm recording this on Easter. And, and this verse, verse 27, really covers all aspects of of the atonement. It says, and this is this is Enos talking, and I soon go to the place of my rest, which is with my Redeemer. Well, notice that, uh, that Enos here uses the word Redeemer. Redemptio means someone who buys back something that he has sold before. Well, we were Christ in the beginning, and now he's going to buy us back through the atonement. He continues to say, For I know that in him I shall rest, and I rejoice in the day when my mortal shall put on immortality. Now that's the resurrection. And shall then stand before him, and that's the judgment. And then shall I see his face with pleasure, and he shall say unto me, Come unto me. Well, that's the atonement, being reunited once again. The book of Enos really is, is a small book, a powerful book on the subject of faith. Now we turn to the book of Jerem. His name is not Hebrew. Jerem is not a Hebrew word. It's an Aramaic word, and it means to prosper or to support one's family. Jerem begins by telling us he writes a few words according to the commandment of his father Enos. He tells us he is writing for the benefits of the Lamanites. Well, Jerem is also familiar with the fact that the Nephites probably, well, know probably about it, the Nephites are not going to survive. So his address and the things he writes are, are, to, the, are to the Lamanites. He knows that, um, that there's going to be trouble ahead. Jerem says, but I shall not write the things of my prophesying nor of my revelations. Oh, well, why not? Well, because they're already written down, he says, quote, For what could I write more than my fathers have written? Jerem mentions that there are many prophets among the people who have revelations and have great faith and have communion with the Holy Spirit. That's kind of an interesting phrase, communion with the Holy Spirit. Mary, the mother of Jesus, had, had communion with the Holy Ghost. Simeon had communion with the Holy Ghost and was told that he would live to see the Messiah. He was at the temple in Jerusalem, as was the prophet, the prophetess Anna. She was in the temple and she had communion with the Holy Ghost and bestowed a blessing on the Holy Family. The Holy Ghost in this case operated before the coming of Christ. It was preparatory. The Holy Ghost prepared the way. Now, 200 years had now passed away, and the people of Nephi had become strong in the land. Jerem and the other priest had worked very diligently and very hard for 21 years to keep the pressure on the people to obey the commandments. Jerem says that many times the Lamanites came against them, but their kings and leaders were mighty men in faith, and they withstood the Lamanites. It's interesting that throughout the Book of Mormon, that all the battles that took place took place on Nephite territory except one, the very end. In Mormon 4.4, 4, Mormon states, And it was because the armies of the Nephites went up unto the Lamanites that they began to be smitten. For it were not for that, the Lamanites would have no power over them. Jerem tells us that through the continual warning of the prophets, including himself, the people were put in check and not destroyed off the face of the land. This continual warning sounds an awful lot like to me what we're going to experience next week, or which you will have already experienced by the time you watch this video, and that's general conference. Jerem now delivers the plates that he has, the small plates, up to his son, Omni. 
Now, omni means belonging to Ammon. During the time of Lehi, Ammon was the god of the Egyptian empire. Omni tells us that he fought much with the sword and yet was a, a wicked man. Uh, this, this man was not a terribly inspired writer. Um, he admits that he's wicked. He is, however, a patriot and a, and a hero in battle, but not particularly a good man. But at least he is honest. Omni delivers the plates up to his son, Amaron. Now, Amaron means beloved. In verse 5, we get another chronology. It says, uh, it says if, you if you take off the 179 years uh, that Enos talked about, you get these three men, Jerem, Omni, and Amaron, covering 141 years, which brings us up to 320 years since leaving Jerusalem. Well, that 141 years gives these three men, Jerem, Omni, and Amaron, about 47 years apiece to experience what they might write. Amron tells us that the more wicked part of the Nephites were destroyed. Isn't it interesting how selective war can be? In Omni 7 it says, Wherefore the Lord did visit them in great judgment. Nevertheless, he did spare the righteous that they should not perish, but delivered them out of the hands of their enemies. Well, Amaron now places uh, these small plates in the hands of his brother, Chemish. Chemish says, Now I, Chemish, write what few things I write in the same book with my brother. Now, Chemish was not the oldest, of course. He's, he's a younger brother, and uh, again, probably the fifth brother. He is apparently a witness to the things being written by his brother, Amaron. Chemish's contribution is merely a colophon. And that is simply something that attests to the authorship of a book and what it covers. In fact, the title page of the Book of Mormon is a colophon. It tells us who wrote it and what time period that it covers. Now, next in line is Abinadam. And this is a good old-fashioned Canaanite name, and it means, My father is benevolent. Abinadam is the son of Chemish. In Omni 10, it says, I, Abinadom, with my own sword, have taken the lives of many of the Lamanites in the defense of my brethren. He tells us he knows of no revelations except that which has already been written. Well, at this particular point in the record of the Nephites, um, it infers that the Nephites are going stale. They're not progressing. They're not moving forward. They become faithless, and something needs to happen. And that something is going to take place when Abinadom hands off the record to his son, Amalekai. Now, Amalekai means my king, my king. And Amalekai is going to introduce us to uh, a fellow by the name of Mosiah. Now, just as Lehi had to leave Jerusalem for fear of, of, his, of his life, and Nephi had to leave the, the land of first inheritance for fear of his life, so it was time for another major move. And Amalekai tells us that Mosiah is going to be the means of that move. Now, Mosiah is a combination of the names of Moses and Yahweh. Mosiah, being warned by the Lord, left the land of Nephi with a group of faithful followers. And he trekked off into the wilderness, and unbeknownst, he came across another group of migrated people from Jerusalem, if you can believe it. And they called themselves the people of Zarahemla. Now, Zarahemla means red city, and probably alludes to an important trading center in the middle of the Sahara that goes by the name of Dar al-Hamra. Dar al Hamra, Zarahamla, Zarahemla, or Red City. There's also kind of an interesting tie between Zarahemla and the Hopi nation. The Hobies say that their people came from, and I quote, the great Red City of the South when it was destroyed because of the wickedness of the people, and we were then led by prophets and came northward. Well, Mosiah's wandering people were much like the 
Puritans or the um, uh, the uh, pilgrims. pilgrims. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> I had eleven grandparents on the Mayflower. Really? Well, the Puritans and the Pilgrims and the Saints, they, they, were, they were wandering about and, uh, and uh, successfully found, of course, as I, as I mentioned, the people of Zarahemla. Now, the people of Zarahemla rejoiced greatly when Mosiah discovered them because he had the record of the Jews. Now, it's really kind of interesting. It took Nephi 50 pages, 50, 50 pages, to describe how his people got from Jerusalem to the Promised Land. Yet here in one verse, verse 16, another group from Palestine arrives in the Promised Land. And we will learn that these people of Zarahemla were once called the Mulekites, a group that left at the time that Zedekiah was king of Judah. They would have left about 586, very close to the same time Lehi left. And they would have been here in the Promised Land about 350 years before they were discovered by Messiah and his people. They were united under Messiah's rule. He became their king, and Messiah taught them, because their language had been corrupted, taught them in the language of the Nephites. Now, Amalekai who lived to see the death of Mosiah, and King Benjamin, his son, would become the king, he tells us that during the reign of Mosiah, a very large stone with engravings is brought to him. Now, King Mosiah had the gift to interpret these engravings, probably by way of the Urim and Thummim. The interpretations give an account of a man by the name of Coriantumr, Coriantumr, who was actually discovered by the people of Zarahemla. And Coriantumr lived with the people of Zarahemla for nine months and was the last surviving person of a race of people that were referred to as the Jaredites. And their story will be told later in the Book of Ether. Well, this concludes the small plates of Nephi. Amalekiah had no seed, so he decided he was going to pass the small plates that he had just completed, over to King Benjamin, son of Mosiah, because King Benjamin was a just man. Now, this gets really kind of interesting. Our record is going to shift rather dramatically. We're going to be introduced now to the words of Mormon, the words of Mormon. And this appears to be Mormon's farewell address, and probably his last writings. We're told that Mormon is about to deliver the record into the hands of his son, Moroni. Now, Mormon had now witnessed, as I'm sure you know, the near destruction of his entire nation, of the Nephite people. And that would have been about 385 A.D. Verses 1 through 11 of the words of Mormon contain the final words of Mormon and they would have been the last words translated by Joseph Smith. Remember, Joseph Smith, with the lost 116 pages, and I'll refer to that again in just a minute, then started in with the abridgment of the large plates of Nephi. The small plates were translated after the fact, so the last thing Joseph Smith would have translated would have been those 11 verses found in the words of Mormon, the last farewell of Mormon. Now, when Martin Harris lost the 116 pages that were translated, he lost, of course, the book of Lehi. But apparently, he also lost the first two chapters of the book of Mosiah. That's kind of interesting. In the original printer's manuscript, Oliver Cowdery crossed out the Roman numeral 3, meaning the third chapter, and called it Mosiah chapter 1 to begin with. So apparently, two chapters of Mosiah were also lost with the book of Lehi. However, verses 12 through 18 of the words of Mormon seem to be not attached really with what Mormon's saying, but they seem to be attached with the book of Mosiah. They're kind of the introduction to the book of Mosiah. So we really didn't lose the entire first two chapters. We have seven verses, 12 through 18 of the book of, of the words of Mormon that are really associated with Mosiah. Now this slide shows the 
the printer's manuscript on the left, and at the top, where it's kind of dark, that's scribbled out. That had three Roman numerals there, and now it's listed on the right, you'll see, as chapter 1 of Mosiah. Now, above chapter 1, you have a verse. It's not all seven verses, but you have verse 18 of the words of Mormon, which ties into the book of Mosiah. So it's kind of a fascinating uh, study here that we've been able to conclude, primarily because of the Joseph Smith papers that, are, that have been done. So the book of Mosiah begins then, uh, the plates of Nephi. And we learn that King Benjamin... King Benjamin, that was Mosiah 1's son, uh, has three sons himself. Mosiah, named after uh, his grandfather, Helaram, and Helaman. And they're all taught in the language of their fathers. And that language would be the language of the plates of brass, which is Reformed Egyptian. King Benjamin is now becoming old, and he decides it's now time to give his farewell speech, and he intends to name a new king and give the people a new name, whereby they might be distinguished above all other people. And in Mosiah chapter 2, verse 3, we learn that this speech and this information that he plans to disseminate is going to be associated with a feast, the Feast of the Tabernacles. Mosiah 2, 3, quote, And they also took the firstlings of their flock, and they, that they might offer sacrifice and burnt offerings according to the law of Moses. Now, this occasion, then, of King Benjamin's speech appears to coincide with the Israeli festival, the Feast of Tabernacles. Every seventh year, people were expected to come to the temple in Jerusalem with their families and sit in booths, or sukkah booths. This was to remind them of their ancestors who dwelt in tents in the wilderness for 40 years. This is also the traditional time of the coronation of a new king. So, King Benjamin's farewell address begins with an accountability of his reign as king. Under the law of Moses, King Benjamin was required to read the law. Fear the Lord, do all the words of God's law, and be equal to those that he served. He also reported that the law that they, that they followed that they observed did not allow for, of course, things like murder and plunder or any manner of wickedness whatsoever. He announces that his son, Messiah, this would be Messiah II, is going to be the ruler and king over them. His coronation probably took place in the temple. Messiah would be given the brass plates as well as the sword of Laban, these sacred artifacts that have been kept and passed down. Mosiah insists the people be obedient and loyal to their new king. Mosiah now shares some words that are given him by an angel. In Mosiah chapter 3, verse 2, and this is very appropriate for today being Easter, he says, And the things which I shall tell thee are made known unto me by an angel from God. And he said unto me, Awake, and I awoke. And behold, he stood before me. And King Benjamin tells the people of the atonement of Jesus Christ. The angel says that Jesus would suffer so intensely that blood would come from every pore. Now, you remember one of the purposes of this particular assembly was to give the people a new name that would separate them from all other people. The new name given them was Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Father of heaven and earth, the creator of all things from the beginning. King Benjamin tells the people to be beware because there would be those that would ridicule the Savior and the things that he did, including his miracles, and say that he was a devil. Well, the latter part of Mosiah chapter 3 tells us that Christ's atonement will cover the sins associated with the transgression of Adam and Eve, the sins of those who have died not knowing God, and the sins of those who are ignorant of the law. And then Mosiah chapter 3 concludes with King Benjamin's speech focusing on the natural man being an enemy of God. So that's kind of what's in these little books and these first three chapters of Mosiah. 
I hope you found a few things of interest to you today. Our next podcast is going to cover material found in Mosiah chapters 4 through 10. That will be two weeks worth of your Come Follow Me materials covering weeks 18 and 19. I want to thank you again for joining me and I look forward to seeing you next time.